Genesis chapter 50, page 45. Then Joseph, leaning over his father's face, wept and kissed him. He commanded his servants, who were physicians, to embalm his father. So they embalmed Israel. They took 40 days to complete this, for embalming takes that long. And the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. When the days of mourning were over, Joseph said to Pharaoh's household, If I have found favour with you, please tell Pharaoh that my father made me take an oath, saying, I'm about to die. You must bury me there in the tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go and bury my father, then I'll return. So Pharaoh said, Go and bury your father in keeping with your oath. Then Joseph went to bury his father, and all Pharaoh's servants, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt went with him, along with all Joseph's household, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their sheep, and their cattle were left in the land of Goshen. Horses and chariots went up with him. It was a very impressive procession. When they reached the threshing floor of Atad, which is across the Jordan, they lamented and wept loudly, and Joseph mourned seven days for his father. When the Canaanite inhabitants of the land saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a solemn mourning on the part of the Egyptians. Therefore, the place is called Abel Mizraim. It is across the Jordan. So Jacob's sons did for him what, they'd, what he'd commanded them. They carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the, field, in the cave at Machpelah in the field near Mamre, which Abraham had purchased as a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. After Joseph buried his father, he returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, if Joseph's holding a grudge against us, he'll certainly repay us for all the wrong we caused him. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before he died, your father gave a command. Say this to Joseph, please forgive your brother's transgression and their sin, the wrong they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when their message came to him. Then his brothers also came to him, bowed down before him and said, We are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph and his father's household remained in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's sons to the third generation. The sons of Manasseh's sons, Machir, were recognised by Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to the land he promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So Joseph made the Israelites take an oath. When God comes to your aid, you are to carry my bones up from here. Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. As the sermon outline there inside your newsletters, uh, please feel free to have that open. We'll see how we go with questions, but uh, if there are any questions and we don't get our time for question time, bail me up on the front lawn. Uh, Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, as we have read your word, you yourself have spoken to us in words that aren't printed but living and active. Uh, Father, at this moment, please still our hearts and minds by your spirit. Please make us alert and receptive to your living words, the living words that confirm your promises the living words that confirm your nature, the living words that confirm your fulfilment, the living words that show us our forever home. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who treat you with contempt and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The promises of God in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, which have hung over the family of Abraham 
ever since God spoke to him. At the very moment, Abraham was turning his back on God. Those promises from Genesis 12, 1 to 3, make clear how God would restore the goodness of his creation, his creation blessing, how God would restore the truth that man or woman made in the image of God would dwell with God in God's place under God's word. That was all over Abraham's family. That would all be through Abraham's family. And it's that promise that we have followed as God has passed it through Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and now further. It's always been by grace, this promise, always been by the mercy and kindness of God, always received by trusting in the God who gave it all. It's the promise that ensured all creation would know how it would be restored, that in Abraham's mob God would reverse the curse of sin and his people would dwell with him once again under his approval. Abraham's family have always lived under that promise. In fact, when you look at the whole book of Genesis, which we'll briefly summarise at the end, the whole book of Genesis is about blessing and promise. It begins with a blessing. It has a promise. It has blessing and promise everywhere. And it finishes with a blessing and a promise at the moment of clarity as Jacob is about to die. Jacob summons his sons, point one on the island, they all gather. There's no hiddenness here, no intrigue, no deception. The man's singing very clearly at the end of his life, I'll tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. And the image that Roz helped us conjure in our mind is a wonderful image, a man seated at 147 on the edge of his bed. His boys gathered around him. All these boys descended from Abraham, who was as good as dead. And so Jacob speaks to them. He proceeds to bless them, to approve or affirm his sons. That's not a random order. He does it in the order of the sons of Leah, then the sons of his maidservants, then the sons of his favourite wife, Rachel. When, When you look at them, if you listen carefully, five boys take the majority of the words. The rest are just simple statements. The first three sons, Reuben, Simeon and Levi, if you've got your Bibles there, Genesis 49, the first three sons, Reuben, Simeon and Levi, are not blessed but cursed, aren't they? Can you imagine the change in the room as these words were spoken? The lives of these men were characterised by sin unrepented of. Reuben had slept with one of his father's wives in order to thumb his nose at God and say, actually, I rule this family. Simeon and Levi, who had indulged their bloodlust and violence in revenge and destroyed a whole city. All of this unrepentant sin has disqualified them from the approval of their father. Judah's next in line. Can you imagine the butterflies? Can you imagine the tension in the room? Because everyone knows what Judah's like. He's been just as sinful, just as fallible, just as headstrong, just as selfish. But there is a difference about Judah, isn't there, as we've watched. Over the decades, Judah has changed. He's moved from being a fearful, selfish and self-indulgent man He's repented and come back to God and he's been established as a man of truth, a man of principle, a man willing to step in as a substitute to care for those around him. Here is unbelievable change in a remarkable man. Unlike Reuben, Simeon and Levi, Judah had changed and he's blessed. Look there in verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the necks of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah is a young lion. My son, you return from the kill. He crouches. He lies down like a lion, like a lioness. Who wants to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it is comes. 
and the obedience of the peoples belongs to him. He ties his donkey to a vine, the colt of his donkey to the choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, his teeth are whiter than milk. That, that is such a contrast to what we've just heard for Reuben, Simeon and Levi, isn't it? It is a sharp contrast. A Judah will be preeminent amongst his brothers. If you're going to choose an animal for Judah, it's going to be a lion, the most feared, the most regal, the strongest, the greatest of the animals in the wild. Judah is described as a family that will produce a line of kings for the people of God. The scepter will never depart from this family. In fact, it will culminate in a ruler to end all rulers, the ruler before whom all nations, including Egypt, will bow down to. And the rule of this final king, it will be prosperous and abundant and influential beyond expectation. It's so abundant, this rule, that you can tie your donkey to the choicest vine because you really don't care how much that donkey eats because you've got so many vines and so many donkeys. In fact, you've got such an abundance of wine. Why use water? I'll wash my robes in wine. His family is preeminent amongst all the brothers, and there will be a line of kings to come from Judah that will rule all nations. Well, Jacob keeps speaking. Uh, you can tell how tidy he is when you get to verse 18. But the next one that he spends a lot of time on is Joseph, and we shouldn't be surprised about this. But as he speaks to Joseph, remember who he's speaking to? Who's he speaking to? Ephraim and Manasseh, isn't he? Ephraim and Manasseh. Look there at what he says to Joseph, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful vine. There's that vine language, a fruitful vine beside a spring. Its branches climb over the wall. The archers attacked him. They shot at him. They were hostile towards him, yet his bow remained steady. His strong arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, by the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, by the God of your father who helps you, by the almighty who blesses you with blessings of the heavens above, blessings of the deep below that lies below, and blessings of the breasts and the womb, the blessings of your father excel, the blessings of my ancestors, the bounty of the eternal hills. May they rest on the head of Joseph on the crown of the prince of his brothers. Joseph, he'll be luxuriant. It'll be an expansive family, just like a vine that you can't shut down. Joseph has been attacked. Joseph has been shot at. Joseph has been treated with great hostility, but it wasn't his self-will, his self-control, his good looks, his muscles or his skills that sustained him. What sustained him? Do you know that roll call of God's names? Just name after name after name about God. Oh, Joseph's impressive. God is amazing. He protected and sustained him. In fact, God has not only protected him, but he would bless this family above all the blessings of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Finishes with Benjamin. Each blessing has been suitable to the nature and life of these men. Do you notice the summary in verse 28? These are the tribes of Israel, 12 in all. And this is what their father said to them. The last of the patriarchs, the great men, is about to die. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob will soon all be buried together. And what will replace them? Not a great man, but a great nation. Do you notice that? It's the first time the 12 tribes of Israel are mentioned in God's word. And the great men have passed, and in their place is a great nation. And at this point, you're meant to go, actually, wow, God's done exactly as he promised. God said there would be a great nation from a man dried up and as good as dead. And look, here is the great nation, 12 tribes to be. Notice that the language is not individualistic. We look for individual applications at this point because that's our culture. The language is all corporate. It's community. It's nation. At this stage, Jacob has one other aspect of the promise of God that he's just seen, he's tasted, it's nascent. 
It's the promise of a land to come. Look there in verse 29. And he commanded them, I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite. I want to go home, boys. I want to be where I belong. I want you to take me back and bury me with my father and my grandfather, with my mother and my grandmother, with my wife. And here as the family blossoms in a nationhood in Egypt, there is a down payment on home. And the down payment is the burial of the patriarchs in a small cave, in a little paddock, in a land promised by God. Take me home. When Jacob had finished instructing his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and died. He was gathered to his people. It's a wonderful image, isn't it? It's gentle. It's kind, it's deliberate. Do you notice that it also has an echo of a resurrection? Where's he going? He's going to be with his mob. He's going to be with his people. He'll be home because of the promises of God. Jacob's wishes are fulfilled. Joseph approaches Pharaoh. Pharaoh gives permission. Joseph says he'll return. Remember, that was the promise of God in Genesis 46, verse 3, Genesis 15, 13. God's mob would be in Egypt and there they would become a great mob. They would be in slavery, sure. They would be there 400 years of suffering, sure, but God would save them. I'll come back, Pharaoh. Just let me go and bury my dad. And the funeral procession sets off. It's a striking procession. Who's leading it? It's the whole court of Egypt. Pharaoh stays home, but the whole royal court attends. Smooth, well-dressed, smelling nicely. What's right behind them? All those hairy sheep herders. The contrast, you're meant to see it. And notice that as it takes place, who mourns? The whole nation of Egypt mourns because this bunch of sheep herders has been a blessing, just as God promised back in Genesis 12. And they have an armed escort that goes with them. The promises of God are everywhere here, aren't they? Even in a funeral procession, the journey's long. It impacts those around them as they enter into the land of Canaan. There is a period of mourning. And then I think in verse 12, it is just Jacob's boys who go with him. So Jacob's sons did for him what he had commanded them. They carried him into the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave at Machpelah in the field near Mamre, which Abraham had purchased as a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. After Joseph buried his father, he returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who'd gone with him to bury his father. The promise of God everywhere there, isn't it? In the numbers that attend, there's a nation. In the reaction of those around, the blessing of God's mob on those around them. In the return of Joseph back to Egypt, the nation will grow there. Even in the fact that they had a cave in the land, there's a down pain. There is a place they belong that God had promised his people. Here are all the hopes and dreams of Abraham's mob. Here are all the hopes and dreams of the world. Well, if Genesis 49 and the start of 50 is about living under the promise of God, and again, it's everywhere, Genesis 50 is about living under the character of the God who promises, under the nature of God. For 17 years, I'm at point two on the outline, for 17 years this family had lived together. It had been a wonderful period, hadn't it? 17 years of reconciliation, restoration, repentance, forgiveness, having those meals, gathering into dad's room, taking him home. But, But as that passes, what emerges again to eat away at that good memory? Sin does, doesn't it? That's what sin does. Sin warps, sin twists. The fears that emerge from sin change your understanding of the truth. They create a dread where there should be delight. Here's a nation and it already looks like it's poisoned and damaged and destructive. It already looks like it will implode. The brothers fear Joseph. Their sin in their hearts has warped the truth. And so they play these desperate games of assurance and confidence of mixed messages. Joseph wept when their message came to him. 
And his brothers also came to him and bowed down before him and said, We're your slaves. Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Don't be afraid. I'll take care of you and your little ones. He comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Do you notice that Joseph weeps at the impact of sin, at the brokenness of brotherhood, at the way in which that festering sin eats at a nation to be and threatens its destruction. Then Joseph reminds his brothers, I'm not God. I'm not God. God is God. And then do you notice he states very clearly the character of God against the character of humans there in verse 20? What's the character of humanity? The character of humanity is sinful, bent on evil, bent on I being God. What's the character of God? character of God is good. God planned it for good. They're buried in that little verse as brothers come together, as fears and dreads and sins bubble up. There is a wonderful image of the nature of God. Do you notice that Joseph doesn't brush over the brokenness of the world? Do you notice that he doesn't avoid the nature of sin? Do you notice that he doesn't rehash his whole life story? It, it hasn't undone everything he's experienced. But what does it do? It points him to the character of God. God is unceasingly faithful. God is unceasingly good. God is unceasingly devoted to his people. And so Joseph reassures his brother, because brothers, because of the nature of God, don't fear. God is in control. God is in charge, in line with his good purpose. And so, you know, Joseph then acts on that. What a commitment there in verse 21. Don't be afraid. I'm going to take care. I'm not God, but I'm going to act on the promise of God and I will take care of you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them because of the nature of God. That nature of God comes through as Joseph himself is about to die. He reaches the ideal age, 110 years. The Egyptians would have looked at this man and gone, he's perfect. But do you notice who he points attention to there as he speaks clearly with his brothers? Look at verse 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to the land he promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So Joseph made the Israelites take an oath. When God comes to your aid, you are to carry my bones up from here. Who's God? He keeps his word. God is working for the good of his people. God has been very clear. Genesis 15 verse 13, Genesis 46 verse 3. This is what will happen. One day I will come and take you home. Egypt is not your forever home. I will take you home. And so on the basis of this, Joseph makes his brothers promise to take him home. He unites the nation under the character of God. And so he sits there in the corner through to the end of Exodus as a reminder of the promise of God, that the nature of God is enough. And so he can wait patiently until that day. On that point three on the outline, Roz asked the question we all ask when we do a series over six years, are we there yet? We got there. Got there to the end of Genesis. We've looked at every chapter. We've seen how the world came to be, how the world was broken, how the world would be fixed. We've wandered with a dysfunctional family for six years, haven't we? Walked with them, talked with them, spent time with them the family that God chose to use to reverse the curse of sin in this broken world. So what what are we going to do out of this with these last two chapters? How how might we apply? I think on the first level, just notice the structure of blessing and promise the whole way through. Right there in Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28, 
So God said, let us make man in our image. In the image of God, he made them. Male and female, he made them. Then he blessed them. First chapter. Be fruitful, multiply, go and represent me to the world. And then as we didn't enjoy the blessing of God and as we chose to be God instead of God, what does God say in Genesis 3.15? From this mob, I'll crush the snake. There's my promise. And that blessing and promise then moved to the man of Abraham who becomes Abraham. And through this family from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, God's promise and blessing stand that humans will once again represent God to the world as it should be and they'll dwell with God in his place, in his way, under his word. And then that blessing and promise, there it is in the last two chapters. Everywhere you look, blessing and promise. The bookends for how the world began, how the world was broken, how the world will be fixed. You can dig a little deeper and marvel at the way in which fulfilment works out even in these closing chapters. Reuben, Reuben who would no longer excel. Reuben produced no prophets, no kings, no judges. Simeon, well, Simeon's land was absorbed by Judah and they didn't have a land. Levi, Levi's mob never owned a block of land. Judah, all the kings come from Judah except the first one and reached the pinnacle of David and Solomon. And Joseph, that boy Ephraim, Well, his name became the name given to the people of God, even right through to the tribe of Benjamin, who was a wolf, whose tribe made up the majority of soldiers of Israel's army. They all come to be. And we see it through those foundational promises made to Abraham. There is now a nation in Egypt. This nation is a blessing to those around them. Even in slavery, they'll be a blessing, won't they? There's no infrastructure in Egypt without Israel. This nation has a land that will be their own, though there's only a down payment, and they're united by the nature of God. But it goes even further, doesn't it? Because one of the key towns in the tribe of Judah is a town called Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem was born the greatest king called David. Well, actually, no, he wasn't the greatest, was he? The greatest king called Jesus. Jesus was a great carpenter, but he was even a greater son of God. And so you get to John 2 and what's his first miracle? He creates abundant wine and not just abundant wine but the best wine and it just keeps flowing. And and then this king, he doesn't tie his donkey to a vine. He rides his donkey into Jerusalem. He's God in the flesh come to take his people home just as Joseph said in Genesis 50 verse 23 and 24 by dealing with their sin. And that man Jesus in his last conversation with his mates in John 14, 1 to 6 says, I'm going away to prepare a room for you and I'll come back to take you to be with me so that you know where I am. I am the way, the truth and the life. And he walks out of a tomb and because he's beaten death, no scepter will pass from his hand. And how's he described in Revelation 5? as he walks into the throne room of God to show his power, he's described as the Lion of Judah. There's the promise of God kept in a most remarkable way. Human nature planned it for evil. Let's kill God's son. God planned it for good. Let's save my people. And even now we wait, don't we? Are you waiting? We're not just waiting for the end of the sermon, are we? There is a land guaranteed. There is a down payment made. There is a promise from God that he will come back. And the character of God hasn't changed. It sustained his people through 400 years of slavery. It will sustain his people as we wait in freedom. And there's Joseph in the corner in his coffin with his hopes and dreams resting on this one truth God will come to take his people home. There is Jesus not in a coffin, not in a tomb, not standing in the corner, but seated at the right hand of God who says, I will come to take you home because I've got the room ready and I'm not going to take you home to a patch of dirt on the Mediterranean. I'm going to take you home to the house that I have built for you in the presence of God. And we wait. 
And as we wait, there are these four questions. Do you know this God? Do you know this God? And what he's done in Jesus, the last descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Judah. Does the nature of this God frame and sustain your life now? Or do we doubt his nature? Do we doubt that God is good? God is good. Jesus is not in a tomb, even though Joseph was in a coffin. And Jesus will come back. Are our hopes and dreams transformed by this? Knowing that Jesus will return to take us to what really is our forever home. And finally, do we offer this to the world? Do we offer them this truth as all of their forever homes fall around them? Do we introduce them to the one who has already built the house for us and will come to take us home? Let me pray. Father, thanks for Genesis. Thank you for your promises and blessing. Father, help us to know you and your nature. Help us to see your fulfilment in Jesus. Frame our lives by your nature seen in him. Sustain us and help us to offer this goodness to those around us as we wait for Jesus to come back. Amen.